This video is going to show you a solo Grandmaster knife for getting platinum rank. For those that just want to see that and skip to the timestamps, but for the rest of you, I can show you the build, etc. Just to remind people, if you haven't already subscribed, make sure you subscribe for more analytical content like this. So for the Grandmaster Knife All Eats Battlegrounds Moon, the surges are Strand Surge, Solar Surge, Overcharged Sniper Rifle, doesn't really matter though too much, and Void Fret. Champions are Barrier Unstartable, so we need to consider that for our loadout. So this loadout I'm going to show you is really good when you're in ad dense activities. So I'm just going to break it down quickly, right? I'm not going to go too slow about it. So Strand Warlock, Heal and Rift, Shackle Grenade is the important part. We have Mind Spun Invocation. So I'll read this out to you. Where does it say that? Hold to consume your Shackle Grenade and activate Weaver's Trance, right? Weaver's Trance is active, creating a suspended detonation. That is the key part. Depending on what nade you pick, depends on how the Weaver's Trance uh, works, so to speak. We've got Weaver's Call on for Fredlins, but you could put on a, where, where is it? Weave Walk. You could potentially do Weave Walk. The problem with doing Weave Walk is you get one less fragment slot. Right? We've got Fred of Isolation for Severin targets, Fred of Fury for melee energy, Fred of Generation for grenade energy, Fred of Mind for class ability energy. Then we use the Fawn, the Poison Exotic Hand Cannon. We use an Indebted Kindness for Barrier Champions, Fixed Odds for um, Incandescent to synergize with the build, which I'll talk about in the run. And we're pairing it all with necrotic grips, right? So the mods are, you can see them on screen. I'm not going to go through every single aspect of this, right? Because a lot of information is in the run itself. But that's generally what we was using in this. So on with the run. So with this starting section, the enemies do cluster up really nice. You need to find some good spots basically to fight from, right? Um... For, a, for this poison build that I used, I believe up top's better than here because you're getting pelted by the uh, Arc Boom and etc. So I end up going up there. But the playback loop of this build is essentially to keep consuming your grenade to get Weaver's Trance to then keep suspended targets on kills and for the detonation suspend, the suspend detonation to spread out to other enemies and to keep sort of keep that chain going. Look at the super energy that we're getting on the left-hand side. It has a sort of weird interaction with, with how that's sort of working. It's really weird because weird how intellect works in PvE. You get your super back when you're fighting against tanky targets via your weapons. But it's also damage over time that gives you intellect back as well in PvE. And it has a sort of a unique effect... So you can get loads of supers is what I'm trying to tell you with this, which the Strand Warlock super is probably better than what it used to be, Needle Storm. It's decent, but it has a range drop off, which I'll talk about when we get to the boss fight. So we're now going to start to isolate champions a little bit. We've got Horde Shuttle on the artifact as well, by the way. That's on the artifact, right, which gives us Fredlins occasionally when we're doing sustained damage against the target. Which is really nice. So we're isolating the champs. We're using indebted kindness. People have been at me about using indebted kindness now for months. Uh, I don't think I've got a single video of me using it. I've had a little play time with indebted kindness. But not that much. Simply because I haven't had a good roll on it yet. Which I've been a little bit annoyed about. I keep getting attrition orbs and stuff. Which I don't want on this particular gun. I've got lead from gold on it, which is good on that left column, but the right column, I've got deconstruct, and I don't want deconstruct on this. Um, not for my general role. I want something, if I look at the column, what's it got? It's got permeability, surrounded, vault shop. One of those three. I've heard people using a Daijo, but why would you use a Daijo on this? I, I don't see why you would. Um, I can see permeability being a thing. Apparently the weapon's strong on strand, and I'm on strand, so that's nice. But listen, don't believe the hype about the permeability thing. I've tested permeability. There's a huge weakness to it. Right? Now, I want you to ask me what the weakness is, and then I'll tell you in the comments, and let's see if people are listening. But there's a massive weakness to it. Once Wizard is killed, the Deftung major target spawns. 
You need to kill him. He's a VIP target. So what we do is we shackle nade him, put in some damage with machine gun or sidearm up to you, and then as the shackle ends, super. This will then kill him. It's important that you do it because you will lose ability energy when he goes to VIP area. And you can't spam your abilities as good because you lose it, your, your, your debuff, aren't you? So it's in your utmost importance that you kill him. Just the way I did. It's really simple to do that. We're going to push up a little bit. Uh, so I use this cover really well. So once, these, once the first wave of enemies are down, we can establish this as being the second main wave. It's three main waves, but there's sub waves in, in each wave. Like this is a sub wave where you get the extra Arc Knight and the Thrall and stuff like that. You don't need to worry about it, but if the Arc Knight, the, sh the sordid ones, push, right, then you make sure you take them out. You back up and take them out from distance. Right, now the ogre spawns in. The ogre melts. Void fret is on this. I highly recommend double void resist with a concussive dampener. Do it like that. Don't do sniper resist. Do concussive dampener. That will help you save against boomer knights. Because they do area of effect damage to you. Do that. And then the void resist will help you against the snipers. Right, because snipers are deadly. They're actually the worst snipers to be up against. The void, scorn snipers. They're worse than probably even fallen arc snipers, and they're bad enough. So look at where we're standing. Why are we standing here? It's position and it's key. The reason is because the ogre can't push. He can't push us here. He can enrage if you let him, but that's all. That's sort of RNG. If an ogre enrages, then you need to back back right up. But for the most part, the ogre will be idle while you get to kill the champs. Champs. So it's an example of isolation. You've got to think about how you can isolate champs away from VIP targets. And this is a good example of me doing that. Of using this piece of cover so the, the barrier is curious and they walk around that corner. You can then isolate and take them easily. Then we'll kill the ogre because the ogre spawns in the next wave you need to kill ogre last so look at what we did with the first phase we killed wizard last to wait for the next phase to be ready for positioning same thing exactly here we kill ogre last after all champs are killed then we start next phase because if you don't do it like that the barrier champions will back up to the other barrier champions barrier champions are hard enough in this in this section because there's so much area of effect damage to you that you want to deal with them last, but th but when there's double barriers, they hold hands. Have you ever been up against barrier double uh, double barriers? Think of light blade. What do they do? They hold hands. It's so difficult to kill them when there's two of them. But if there's only one of them, they're weakened. This is a key AI pattern trait that you need to realize. And any time you can isolate barriers away from each other, do so. Because if, if you were to leave a barrier from an earlier phase, phase 2 adds, right, then it would be much more difficult. A unstop and a barrier together is also a bit of a deadly combo, but you can control unstops a little bit easier. And there is a, there is a way to enrage this unstop to push to make him push down here, but it's, it's a little difficult to do, so I opted not to bother doing that. I have done it on a previous one where you enrage them and they push... And he isolates the unstoppable away from the boomers and, and all that stuff at the top. But it doesn't matter. We're going to end up killing him anyways. So this cover, how I'm exactly playing this is a good way of doing it. We didn't get the stop. That's so unfortunate. So actually we did enrage the unstoppable. So I'm telling you a lie. So look. Eventually the unstop will push you. If, if you push all the way to the right side, this will happen. Um, that's actually good. So there you go. I just lied to you a second ago, so you can get the Untouchable to push. So now, um, we're going to clear out the rest of the ads. So, Tangles, right, obviously do sh um, shooting those near ads helps you. Procking your Shackle Grenade and then going in with the Poison Damage off Fawn will then do a lot of Suspend and Burst like so. Like, look, you're controlling the enemies. That's why it's so good, this. I will say something about Fawn. Right, whilst the gameplay uh, plays out. Fawn is only good on this build. It's a harsh reality. Even with Catalyst, right? The reason why it's not that good on any other build is because it's got 9 in the mag, 
which is too low low of a mag size for a hand cannon, in my opinion, of this archetype. I think it's 140, isn't it, Fawn? I'm not sure, but it's not a high impact frame, though, is it? So it should have a higher mag than 9. Now, you're going to say to me, well, look at the Soul Devourer and all that stuff. You pick up the orbs and you get ammo back. Yeah, but you can't go and safely pick up the orbs all ta at all times. So it's a problem. I think this gun should have shooter loot on it. So you're able to shoot the orbs to refund ammo. Th that's the problem solved. That will then help the gun. It will help it go into the next level of power, right? It it's really good as it is now, but only on the poison build that you're seeing here. On any other build, you don't want to use Fawn. You probably would run Malfeasance if you want an exotic kind of kind of next lot. It's Malfeasance all day. So, this is exclusive to Warlocks. I don't recommend you do this on a Hunter with a Fawn. I don't recommend you do this on a Titan with Fawn. Definitely not. It only works with this because Fawn's poison damage synergizes with Weaver's Trance. And that's what makes this good on ad dense GMs and this is an ad dense GM so you're gonna see the absolute me showing you it in the best light and it's really good but it has limitations it's a hand cannon um, that's a limitation right away if you're up against ranged enemies because it's not gonna do as well as wish ender or low monarch in GMs but it is hard to compete with such things we've got a sip but we're gonna use it on this target we're gonna do the jump method with indebted kindness so that look at the night the ultra vip can't hit us yeah and we can just jump and then keep doing that one thing on the bosses and majors and minors so people get confused with this if you have a named boss he's counted as a boss in the game champions are counted as bosses so they account for boss spec so make sure you've got boss spec in your stuff right um boss spec in everything i've already made a video about why you should be doing this um because they've changed it you should have caught that video i hope that you did see it if you didn't then run boss spec in all your stuff don't be running minor spec only if somebody very intelligent commented on that boss spec video and said you could run minor spec on a lightweight frame bow if it means that you will two shot a minor as opposed to three shot them. That is intelligent. And yeah, that will be a case where you might run minor spec. So that's that is this prism in what you make a decision between boss spec, minor spec, and major spec. Is will it go from a will you buff your legendary enough to two shot in a GM with a surge? If that's the case and that's nice to you, then fair enough. But just bear in mind, there is times when you only have a primary. Some people say to me, I'm not using primaries on champs. I'm not using primaries on champs. Why not? Sometimes you might need to save ammo for a later critical moment. So sometimes you do just primary a champ down for so much, or maybe one phase, and then break out the heavy, and then break. So this is how you manage your ammo. So you, there is times when you're just going to use primary to kill a champ for so long right so don't be so one-dimensional by saying well i'm not going to use a primary on a champ you definitely are champ mods are linked to primaries we, you don't have unstoppable fusion rifle or unstoppable this or unstoppable that you do have the chill clip you've got chill clip uh riptide but that's not what i'm on about i'm on about the artifact mods the artifact mods are all primaries so chances are you're going to be doing damage to a champ with a primary so boss spec is, is the way to go. But on an exotic primary, obviously you can't put a, a spec in there. So uh, it doesn't matter either way. This section, I'm just running through it. This is why I'm not giving any comment on this bit. Um, we haven't got a Roman super because obviously Neil Storm isn't. We sh generally, if I had a Roman super on me, I would pop that and then run through with the super. But I don't have that option, option so I'm just showing off a bit of fallen gameplay. It's good in this situation where you can kill the ad, run and gun, and pick up the orb. You can see how it's good in a run and gun situation. But when you're behind cover and you're having to fight ads from a range so much so that you can't pick up the orbs that it generates, then it loses potency. And that's why I say give it loot to sh shoot to loot, where if you shoot the orbs, you get the refund and you can pick up orbs of power. They would have to make it craftable at that at that time, but Fawn's not linked to any exotic mission. So 
that would be kind of difficult, wouldn't it? Um, you know, so that's just that's just a way of buffing it, right? But it is really good on. It's potent on a warlock, but that's the only build that you really want to be using this in end game content. In on planets, like I've said, on planets you can do what you want. You can go and have sandwiches and then live the game and be AFK and you can do stuff like that. In GM content, you need to be focused in the game and make sure that you've got your build applicable to what you're doing. So did you see, if you didn't see what I just did when I scanned the ghost, I recommend that you replay that phase, what I did, what I did there. You need to copy it exactly if you want to achieve the ghost room cheese, defend the ghost cheese, you need to do exactly what I did there. The The way that you know if you're in here properly in this girder is if your character sort of floats up as you get in here. I'm not giving you too much tips on about it because some people may, like ask me anyways and don't watch the video. So listen, I've told you once how to do it. If you're still confused about it, you need to replay the footage. Put it at 0 0.5 speed if you must to check it. This allows you to kill champs and priority targets. So at 25%, you get two unstoppable champions and a VIP ultra boss, right? So you need to kill those to re-establish the connection. Ads have no bearing on the connection. So you don't need to focus them too much, but if you want to try and proc a suspend and burst, on say an ad to then suspend the VIP, that's a good strat. The unstartables as well, there's a little RNG with them whether they push you or not like this. Generally they won't. Nine times out of ten, two of them will go around the backside and hide and one will push you at a time. This is a mechanic that champs have they hunt they they hunt you down in packs. But what they will also do is have a formation where one stands back, one pushes. This is what's exactly happening here. It's funny because you can actually see in-game it happening. But I'm stopping it from happening because I've got sus suspend and bursts on. Overload champions do this as well. One will push, one will stay back. And they act differently depending on whether there's adds up or if there isn't. Unstoppables are slightly different on that variation to what overloads are. Because by nature, because the... Within a certain radius, they have to push you and both will. But if you stand at range where they can't really hit you, one will push, one will stay back. And this is exactly what's happening. Like, look, now that unstop pushes because his mate just died. So that's exactly what's happening here. I could do a video on, on, on the AI pattern of champs, but it would be too complicated to make the video. Um, so I suggest that you just watch all my the GMs that I've done over the years. I've even got a playlist. Some the other day asked me about you should put your videos in a playlist. Have you seen my channel? There's a literal playlist of Grandma Snipers, right? Literally, I've the playlists are there. There's you just go on a playlist of the channel and they're there. So if you want more in-depth information on Overlord Champions and exactly how they work. Overload champions, barriers, and unstoppables. Then there's a plethora of information out there. It's it's that old thing that if you want to know, you'll find out that information. If you kind of do, if you kind of not that interested, then you kind of won't learn that information, will you? Really? And then you'll end up asking somebody, "How does this exactly work?" Well, the information's been out there since 2019. I think, you know, if you've been playing since then, you should know. And if you don't know, then you need to have a you need to be proactive about your learning and research. Be proactive about it and then chances are you're going to learn your stuff. If you're not proactive and you're relying on somebody else to just tell you there and then, you know, I'm not on YouTube 24-7 to come up and tell you and comment and say, this is exactly how it works and then solve all your problems. You need to be also proactive yourself about learning Champ AI. It's as simple as that. To me, for me to make the video on it would be so for me to make it properly would be too difficult. It would be, it would be, it would mean that I would have to go through a library of hours of content to find the exact times of what the what champs did in this scenario and that scenario, and show you all the scenarios. And in my mind, there's so many different scenarios that can happen that the video will be so long that it wouldn't be worth making because people wouldn't even watch it anyways if it's over 10 minutes. 
So you need to, as I say, if you want to look at information, look at a over, look at a nightfall that I do. We that's proactively overload champions. A good a good example of that is corrupted warden and nothing stuff like that. Um, this is a good example of unstoppable champions. In this one, I just give you a, a, a tip on enrage and overload uh, unstoppables. This isn't a good one for barriers because there's not a lot of them. But I did say already, the holding the hand mechanic and the hunter dodge move they have, all that sort of stuff. You notice I haven't used indebted kindness. Don't use it. Don't use it in this cheese spot. You will actually hurt yourself and it will knock you out of the cheese spot. Funnily enough, it can. If you move at all, right, so you can only move, for me, it's my right stick. So I can only move my right stick for... To move my ADS. I can't move my character. If you move your character at all, the ads will need you and kill you. Also, it's RNG what room, what door the unstoppable spawn out of. There's three or four doors in this section, right? So it's RNG which which room they spawn out of. You want the top door, but RNG is gonna probably be against you, so don't rely on that. Don't worry about it though, you'll kill them anyways, because they'll come to round the side of the girder. And then Fawn will make short work of them, of course. Try and shoot them in the arm with the machine gun. Right? That's what, I, that's what I've been doing. Like so. You can't get crit, unfortunate, but you can't. So you just have to go ahead and get body shot damage. But that's what makes fixed odds so good. By the way, fixed odds incandescent synergizes with, tran uh, with the suspend and burst damage that you do with, trans with the trans uh, consuming your shackle grenade perk thing. So that's why it's on as well. And not only that, fixed odds has just been so good to us this season. We've actually been spoilt with this machine gun on how good it's been. Because it's got enhanced field prep, you can spam it for a long period of time and it's very valuable. Field prep weapons in Grandmaster Nightfalls are very valuable. I know that we talk about your envious assassins and your recon reconstructions. That stuff loses a little power in Grandmasters, funnily enough. I, I prefer the explosive light in Grandmaster content because it's just something where you can just proc really easy. There's less work, right? Because there's already a lot of work for you to do anyways. So Grandmaster Nightfall, the, the, the perk selection on guns changes for me slightly. Like I prefer not to use bait and switch as much. Bait and switch is more of a DPS perk, and Grandmasters are you, you are not doing DPS in Grandmaster Nightfall content. You're doing burst damage, right? But as long as you're within good control of Champ AI, then you don't really need like sort of DPS per se. Surges help out, you know. Obviously they do. I didn't run. I didn't run surges, but. You just play to the Grandmaster. It gives you the modifiers for free. There's, there's Solar Surge on, Strand Surge on. You just play to that and it gives you the Surge. So don't worry about like Surges on your boots and all that sort of stuff. Just worry about your build and being sensible to the GM that you're doing. You know, don't run something like Monte Carlo or something. Even though, yeah, that's going to give you more uptime on your Poison melee. But it's an Overload or a Rifle. There's no Overload champs in this. You see how that build doesn't work? You could make it work because you can use Shackle for unstop, but then you don't have a true unstoppable weapon. So Fawn's better in this situation because it's unstoppable hand cannon. It's really as simple as that, and it's more accessible to you, even though it's less uptime on your melee. But you're getting plenty of melees anyways. I've chose to not do this bit and just skip. We're going to kill the two extra champs. If you don't do the prisms... You get two extra champs, one barrier, one on stop, right? So I was just showing off the build a little bit there. Uh, so we sped up the footage as well, just to speed up the run a little bit. The video, shall I say? It's no problem to you to kill these two champs. It's gonna you're gonna lo lose about two minutes of time. It doesn't really matter, but it's quite risky on Strand Warlock to do the Prism Strat, and you've got to be exact on what you want to do. And I didn't want to showcase that in the video. I just wanted to show people that just ignore that mechanic. Kill a load of ads so that you can refill up on ammo when the ads are dead, when the champs are dead. So we're not going to get the brick, the brick that you get for doing the prisms. 
but it doesn't matter because the ads will have more than likely give us the ammo back anyways. By the way, in Dirty Kindness, one shot shields, it's such good. It's it's, it's so good. I, I I mean, I haven't even, I guess I got a good roll here. Lead from Gold's all right on it. Um, only because that's one of the only good perks in, in, the, in that slot. But it's, it's really good. The sidearms are like, they are GM weapons. They're really good. Like, like rocket sidearms. Man, they're so good. You need to be farming up the um, Warlord's Ruin for this indebted kindness. It's the best weapon from there, in my opinion. Probably that and the Caster Frame Sword. But Dirty Kindness, even even a poorly rolled one, is like mini arbalist. It's a mini arbalist this season. Such a good weapon. And the damage it puts out is really good as well. So we activate the switch. We're going to show you, the, obviously, the exploit with this. Uh, so you jump on there, and then you run up the pipe. Really straightforward. Just make sure you don't fall off, of course, because you will lose your um, GM. You have to go to orbit and start it again, and you don't want to do that at 25 minutes in. So you come to this location, and then we can start killing enemies. So you need to understand this exploit zone. We're going to speed up the footage as well, just so that the video is not as not too long. The reason why we do things like this, by the way, is because it doesn't bloat the video. I don't want to put out the video too bloated. And we did lose a bit of time on this run on the final phase, which is why it was a little bit longer than what I hoped. Should have been about 40, 45 minutes, but it was a little bit longer than that. So the reason why I don't want bloaty GM videos is because people don't watch much of the video anyways. Just to give you information on it, people will only, on average, watch 10 minutes of a solo GM, whether it be 40 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour, depending on what the GM is. So... Now that, well, I, do, I have known this for quite some time, but I'm putting in a lot of work and you aren't watching enough of it to justify me going all in and giving you the best possible um, information. Well, I am giving you the best possible information, but I, I don't care about it as much as maybe I should because of, of me knowing that you only watch 10 minutes of the video. And this is true across everybody. This is, Dato said this exact quote, he w doesn't do the GMs because he knows, the solo GMs that is, because he knows that he's only watched 10 minutes of it on average. So he doesn't do them. And Dato's the cleverest fella on YouTube. He's the cleverest guy in terms of, he knows that when not to do content and, and when to do it. So if he's not doing them, there's probably a good reason why he isn't. And the reason is not because of skill or anything. It's just because he knows the, the, the effort put in is you don't get return. You would think the effort you put in, you get out. You definitely don't. You actually, for some players, they are actually hurting themselves by doing solo GMs. It's crazy, but that's what we live in. What you use lot want, from what I've learned, from what you use lot want, are just videos that help you as a player. Short 10 to 15 minute videos maximum. That's what you want, which is why I've been doing the craft videos and, the, and looking at mods and trying to give you tips that way. That's what you's actually ultimate. Most of you want that. You don't want this long format content of like looking at a video that's quite long and then me giving you information halfway through and then at 43 minutes telling you this information. You just want information fast and within 10 minutes. It's a shame because like the whole long format thing, it's more, it's more for Twitch. It's better for Twitch. YouTube, it's it's probably worse. You're worse off. So that's why you're seeing that I'm sprinkling more thoughts type videos, more, you know, re regarding news a little bit more over the GMs. We're still going to do the solo GMs. And it, it, the problem with the solo GMs is that we've still got the same GMs that we've had since last year. So it's feeling still at this point. I, I have little reason to play any GMs. I'll get more motivated when we see more GMs, you know. And I hope there's a fresh new suite of GMs with file ship to the point that I'm really motivated to play them. Because at the minute, I'm not that motivated to play them. The only motivation is if I can try and show off a new, unique build to um, make you think about what to run.
that's really the only motivation for you. Or if there's a weapon to farm. This week's undercurrent, which it's not that good of a weapon, if, if I'm being honest, especially the fact that we're getting four bearings. So that's also another reason. It's like, well, the weapon's bad. But what you need to understand is, if there's a bad knife or weapon up, do you understand that's for one week? Do you realize one week of time on YouTube is a long time? So that means I've got to work with a shitty knife fall for a week. And sometimes you'll see I just skip an entire week of GMs and just be like, I'm not uploading GMs. I'm going to do something else because I'm just not bothered or interested at all. And I feel as though the interest is low anyways. So you won't see me do it because of this. You know, like, am I going to run a, a, another GM this week on Hunter and uh, Titan? Maybe not. Maybe maybe a Titan run this weekend, depending on how well this one does. We'll just see. But I'll probably focus my attention on something else, something more valuable, something that's going to um, reward my time a little bit more. Um, but we'll see. So we're now prepping the room. What you've seen there, I've been prepping the room. Obviously, there's two one stops. Um, but we're also clearing out all the Scorn enemies. We are, we've killed one of the captains. Because there's three captains that spawn up on this phase. We want to kill one of them because... Funny thing is... Only two can be up at a time once you've killed the third one. So, in other words, three don't spawn up. It goes to two. That's a huge deal. Having one less captain on the field means that you won't die. With three captains up down there, you're probably going to get melted by them. They melt because the scorn captains are the ones that do the up-close damage. Right? They absolutely melt. He's even trying to melt me back here. So what we're doing is we're prepping. So the prep is this. Kill one scorn captain and the other two kill them. Uh, the other two finish them. Keep them finishable because down there you want to prep them. You want to prime them so that they're easy to kill down there. Because once you do go down there, you need to be bob on with what you're doing. You need to be right on with what you're doing. So make sure all scorn raiders are dead. Make sure the unstoppables are dead, etc. Try to peek out. Do your peak damage because the boss, even though shielded, is a void sniper and do, does massive damage. You can't afford to be sniped twice, but you can afford to be sniped once. Regard, um, bear in mind if you're full HP, right? So, prep your two captains, make them finishable, which is exactly what I'm doing now. Don't spam too much machine gun up here. That's why I haven't, because you want a decent amount of machine gun, because you're going to be spamming it for survivability on this phase. Whilst fawn's good, it's going to also be not as powerful as the machine gun for just quickly killing enemies sometimes. So... You're not going to just rely on fawn for killing the enemy ad wave because you're going to be down there anyways. So we need to prep this captain here. Let's hope we don't kill him because if you do kill him, just one spawns up in his place. They do that so that you won't soft lock the activity because then you can't get batteries. They give you the batteries, of course. So we've got five batteries to dunk. Right, we're going to get them finishable and then we're going to make sure we exit properly. Because the boss can kill you while you jump down. So I choose to jump down um, over here. We're looking for captains. Have they de-aggroed? They have de-aggroed, which means they're far away from me. So I'll jump down. Keep your movement around the pillars and get around this uh, generator. There's one left and right. Bottom left and right. That's where you're going to fight from. So there is one ad left up. Even one stalker is a threat to you. The void nades are the threat. The, I'm not going to lie. The void for the void nades will kill you so quick because of void threat. So what we're going to try and do is de-aggro the captain that's alive and then kill the other one. Because what happens is when that captain is killed, the other one pushes. Look, they have the same AI pattern or very similar to a champ. I wouldn't be um, surprised if they have got the similar AI pattern to them because... Did you notice they were separated? As soon as one dies, he pushes. That's his pattern. Push you right away. I could have died there. I was really lucky. Um, we'll, we'll loop round. As the fresh captain has spawned up because we killed both. That's fine though. Sometimes you have to do that. Uh, and in that case, uh, you know, things like that can happen. So we're going to pop our shackle. And then machine gun. Get suspend and burst and just keep killing the stalkers. Peeking in and out. 
be aware the boss can snipe and kill you so you got to be careful the solar holster helps out massively on this i've got solar holster on the boot on the boots which works really well with machine guns so just make sure that all the ads are killed or most of them emote regularly to see if there's any ads in mid there doesn't look to be but i know that there is one or two because ads hunt in ads hunt in packs as well so once there's only one or two left they hide and it's 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 a pain because later on you don't want them up when you dunk and battery because that is when you're vulnerable indebted kindness is really good for just instantly taking the shield so we'll kill keep aware of that second captain because he'll push you maybe try and get a fawn shot on him to de-aggro him before you kill that one and that may help to stop him from pushing you because there is a little thing called threat level in d2 where if enemies are threatened enough by you they won't push you this is also a thing so you can do it to the poison damage may deter him it may not void nade on my feet nearly killed us but that's fine because we had a healer near down for that bit we're going to try and de-aggro this captain because he's pushing i don't like it captain backs off notice the threat level and then we can start killing all the uh, stalkers see that mechanic what i was on about the threat level thing i wish the hp bar below it had an extra bar of how threatened an enemies are and then there was an in then there's an in-game visual in indication to tell you are they threatened or not if they done that i think it would help people understand enemies much more than what they do right now i'm literally just going off ai patterns of what i've from the past yeah so i sort of already know how these how these enemies are going to react in terms of my positioning and what i do um there was one stalker up here make sure when you dunk the battery you look at where the boss is and dunk on the opposite side of him so he doesn't snipe you use the generator thing as cover the one in middle as well you start of using it as cover we're on three out of five batteries you can cheese it but it's difficult to pull off the um, battery dupe location um, it's difficult I wouldn't recommend it it's a risky strat unless you're on hunt, void hunter maybe do it but even then I, I don't recommend that you do it there's people that will that can do it and will but I wouldn't recommend that you dupe the the batteries don't worry about it just do it just do the phases as as it is stalkers need to be killed immediately they are the threat not so much raiders the raiders will just do their void attacks like so but it's the stalkers as soon as you go into cover their ai pattern is to nade you and you want to go in cover so they're gonna nade you so it's it's that thing of the quicker you melt them down the safer you are but do it in such a manner where you're peeking in and out this captain sees us Uh, we're going to see if there's any enemies in mid. Doesn't look to be, but I know that there is. Uh, and then we're going to decide to kill. I don't know why that's not hitting. So we'll use fawn. We're just going to run for it. it. The orb's in mid, which is good. So if you can get your captain right directly in mid like that, it means that you have a better chance of dunk. Dunk in the battery. Then we'll slide down the stairs. Notice we slide down as well to avoid sniping the head. Every little thing is important. All these little tips. It's not just a case of I'm running, right? I'm just running down. You, you actively make doing every little minor adjustments with your movement to make sure that you don't get sniped by the boss. That is your ultimate goal on this phase is not to be sniped. Now, you could use Weave Walker on this. And I could see that being a strap for people. Because you could dunk battery, then Weave Walk for every battery. And I see that being a strap. The only reason why I didn't is because it's one fragment less and I wanted to try and um, show the build off as much as possible. But if I was to run this back, I would try a weave walk run because that would actually make the battery phase really consistent on a strap wall because it's almost, it's almost invis with the weave walk and it would make it consistent getting to the exploit zone. So for players of less skill and maybe don't with really the play strand wallock much but want to try it out maybe try weave walking after duncan battery and get shot of one of the fragments maybe the melee one or something because you're still going to get plenty of melee energy anyways really to be honest so on four out of five batteries um there is some ads in mid and they're not pushing so we're gonna have to go with it 
that's fine so Fawn should get the bleed out on that it has the battery's directly in mid which is good favorable to us but we are in danger here stalkers raiders slide down the stairs like that and now we need to get to exploit zone so pay attention to health health needs to be full hp because if you are sniped you will survive it if you're not full hp you will die to a snipe the boss luckily didn't snipe us and if your movement's good enough then you probably won't die there if you move and sloppy at all and you bounce into something that you shouldn't you probably will die there so you need to know exactly what you're doing We'll speed up the footage again because this is just us killing the enemies from uh, a range. But more just to showcase the build as well. You'll see that basically most of the time the, the room is clear because of how good the build is. What it's not good for though is damage on the boss. I know it's like... Wish Ender would have done more, Polaris Lance would have done better at doing DPS on the boss. It would have been a quicker run as a result of it. That's why I think I've run a Polaris Lance run on this already, so I've already showcased that off. Um, that's overall a better build than this for this run. But it's really good on the add dense sections. It really is. It's really decent with the suspend and burst. So yeah, we can just keep doing ramp, uh, damage from a range. I notice as well that the needle storm, it has range drop off. Now it looks to me, so let's try and, I don't know what meters that would be away from the boss there. It could be 20, 25 meters. So I think anything more than 20 meters, the needle storm's not as effective. But at the same time, if you're too close to a boss or an enemy and you needle storm right next to them, it doesn't do the damage it should. It's kind of like Blade Barrage where you sort of need to be the, the right range away for you to get the full effect of it. And I found that I wasn't really getting much damage with needle storm on the boss. So I opted just to use it on enemies. Because there's still a chance of death up here. Right? So it's a case of just clear them out. The boss will uh, de-aggro and re-aggro. Sometimes he's on the left side. He sort of follows a pattern as well. He loops all the way around the map. Um, but just in case, just keep doing your poison damage with Fawn. Um, you can use Indebted Kindness. Just be careful that there's an invisible wall. And if Indebted Kindness hits the wall, you do self-inflicted damage. So I didn't really want to do much Indebted Kindness damage to the boss. I was just mainly doing the poison damage, maybe sometimes super, sometimes a bit of machine gun. Uh, he'll keep putting up his tethers, which is annoying. But just take those out, of course. Your super will penetrate that, by the way. It will penetrate the immunity. That's what supers do. Well, the Radiance does this as well. The only super that doesn't do it is Bubble, which I've said for years it should penetrate immunity. Why isn't it? Well does. Bubble should as well. It's a super. Or, or at least a, a support style super, but, but so is Well. Well is a support style super. Those nades as well, although they look dangerous, they don't hit you. But don't stand too far on the edge is basically the tip about this. So let's keep doing our damage. We've got a super, but the boss is so far away. So I got a bad RNG on this phase two, on on. on on this second phase where the boss was just sitting so far back so my form was doing less damage even though it's got increased range the re the increased range i feel as though the catalyst was more pvp based than pve especially when i saw the catalyst like the the catalyst for fawn should have been increased damage for poison that should have been some of it now are they balanced out for pvp well that's not my problem to uh, think about I'm just saying for as a PvE player Ultimately, that's what it should have been about. I think well it should have been that under the, and the range So then therefore you're satisfying PvP players and PvE players. That was the run on this. I hope you enjoy. Thank you